you water the root of the tree and then you're able to enjoy the fruit of it. So you have to really take care of the person as a whole. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we have an episode for you about spirituality, manifestation, releasing limiting beliefs, and more. Our guest today is Letha J. Letha J is a spiritual manifestation coach and Ayurvedic practitioner who blends modern knowledge with traditional wisdom. She integrates what she has learned through life experiences to teach people to shift perceptions, manifest, and live happier lives. She is passionate about guiding clients through lifestyle and mindset modifications to flat out transform their lives to a new experience of happiness, freedom, and love. When not working with clients, writing, spending time with her family, or building courses, Letha spends her days learning from others, farming, and persistently maintaining a beginner's mindset in everything. Before we begin today, I want to let you know about the new 2023 Artist of Life Workbook, our top-selling guided journal to help you create your most intentional and successful year. You can check it out at shop.lavendare.com. All right, on to the interview. Hi, Letha. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, so why don't you tell us your story of how you got into spirituality and healing? Yeah, of course. So I was raised in a traditional Indian household. So spirituality, religion, our practice was kind of ingrained into who I was from a very, very young age. My family meditated on a regular basis. You know, we ate largely vegetarian later on in my teenage years. We we didn't. But um, it was all so ingrained into how we lived our life every day. And it wasn't until really in my probably in my early 20s where I had like this huge spiritual awakening. It actually happened when I was in medical school. So I pursued medical school thinking that I wanted to become a doctor. Um, And seven and a half years in, right before graduation, a couple months out of graduation, I couldn't pretend I wanted to be a doctor anymore, you know? And I left. I dropped out of medical school right at the last minute. Everybody was like, what? (laughs) Are you crazy? I know. After so long. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You're so close, you know. Um, but I knew in my heart of hearts that it wasn't for me. I didn't know what I wanted, but I was so, so clear on what I didn't want and what wasn't mm-hmm. working in my life. I had to go. So I actually ended up in Arizona um, on a farm and I had this like big spiritual awakening, just like this idea of like, there's more to life, you know, there's more to life and life isn't meant to be the way that it was like waking up every day, feeling tired or resentful or angry or unhappy. I was like, there has to be more, there has to be more. And I, at that moment, I kind of like made my life to be more, you know? And I was like, I'm going to find more. I'm going to be this more that I think that life can be. And that's kind of what really like set things off. And from there, you know, I went on to um, get certified in yoga and meditation and learn all of these things from teachers, right? Not just from my family or from practitioners that I knew, family, friends kind of thing, but from teachers. And then I went on to get a master's degree in Ayurvedic science and integrative medicine. And I realized that all of these little things was like a compendium coming together in which I could then use the things that I was learning to help the clients that I serve. And it's been a beautiful, beautiful ride. Yeah. So how long did you leave medical school? Like, What's the timeline of all of this happening to now coaching? Yeah. So I've been a coach now for a little bit over 10 years. I started in 2011. Yeah. uh And I had left medical school just a little bit prior to that. Wow. Um, And then I'm curious about what your whole family thought about that process, because you mentioned that you grew up spiritual, like, you know, your your family was into spirituality and wellness, but at the same time, I know like, you know, I'm I'm sure they wanted you to be a doctor. Like, well, how did they take that decision? Oh, they took it rough. (laughs) (laughs) How was that? How was navigating that? (laughs) So I am one of three children. I have two siblings um, and we're all very, very close. Both of my other siblings are, (laughs) I want to say like renowned doctors, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put them on blast, but they are well known, well educated, top of their class, you know, like, like literally saving lives every day, doctors. (laughs) Um, So it was like in my family that like we were meant to be doctors, right? This is what Uh my family did. So when I was just like up and (laughs) decided to leave, everybody was like, but what are you going to do? And I kept thinking, I don't know, but I know what I'm not going to do. You know, I know what's not for me. I don't know where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do, but I know where I'm not going to go. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And that kind of helped me clarify, just kind of decide that I was going to take next steps and try, just try to search it. You know, in that period of time, it was almost like I was throwing spaghetti against a wall and seeing what would stick. I had no yeah. idea what I yeah. wanted. Like, did, you, know? you didn't have and, a strategy. You're just like, Oh, like what, what mm-hmm. made, what led you to the farm or what led you to like, you know, studying what you ended up studying? So I moved, I moved to Arizona to that farm because I needed somewhere to go. I was afraid to go back home to my parents, honestly. Not that they were like threatening me or anything like that, but they were just like, what's happening with you? Like, are you okay? Kind of thing. And I was like, I just need a minute. So I actually became a woofer, which is, um, it's a program. It's called the World Organization of Organic Farmers. And basically you go and you work on their farm for free and um, they feed you and they let you stay there. And I was like, all right, that's kind of what I need right now. You know? So I I farmed beets and um, little sprouts and kohlrabi. That was like the first, my first introduction to kohlrabi was on this farm. Um, And it was a beautiful experience and it gave me a lot of time to be by myself. And it gave me a lot of time to think, to be under the stars. My cell phone didn't work. There was no service out there. You know, I had no distractions and it was perfect. Yeah. And so did you continue your studies leading up to being a coach or do you, did you already feel like, you know, where did you, where and how did you build your knowledge? Yeah. Um, so I, even prior to going to medical school, I had degrees in biology and psychology, um, in, and a couple of other things I had been studying and been interested in later on. I did get certified, uh, with IAN, which was the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, um, and became a health coach for a short period of time. But I was like, no, I think there's more to this and how I want to support people. And then it was with my other certifications that I really started to take on more clients and help them in different ways. So originally I did start out mainly in the health aspect. I started um, with nutrition. And then- and then it, it started extends. with nutrition. Correct. Uh, yeah. And then later on, I went to get a master's degree in Ayurvedic science and integrative medicine because I was so interested in still that. Right. Yeah. And even today, I don't very much practice Ayurveda, honestly. Um, um, every now and then, you know, I'll slip it into when I'm working with a client. But my main focus is on the spiritual aspects of it. And a, and a, and a big portion of Ayurveda is spiritual. So I won't say that I don't practice at all. But a lot of times when people think of Ayurveda, they think of the herbal aspects of it. And I don't really necessarily do that anymore. So, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I, I think I assumed you still practice that cause you have the background. So what's your reason for why you don't practice it? I, I'm just curious. No, I think that that's a great question. Cause it's like, wait, you went to school, you got a master's degree, you studied this for like, you know, five years, uh, very dedicated to it. And, um, I, I love it. And it, it is for me personally, but I just, had issues with dealing with it in America with the laws. <laughs> so I never wanted to get in trouble for recommending something or having, you know, and it just became like such an issue. Yeah. Because it it's really like became more such holistic. An issue. It's like kind Correct. of like. Mm-hmm. And the legality behind it and stuff like that. I didn't want to deal with all that aspects of it. I am still very much involved in Ayurveda with our life. That's how I treat my children and my husband and things like that. That's what we follow. Um, And any of my friends and family will always come to me for references. But when it came to the legality and the aspects of it and the FDA and all those things, I was just like, this is a lot of red tape and paperwork. And that was also, it was like in conjunction with my um, spiritual business really taking off. So I was like, let me put my focus in what's working and how I can best serve people. And in that mm-hmm. moment, it was in that spiritual aspect. I see. Okay. I, let me clarify. When I asked, like, did you still practice? I thought you meant like you don't integrate like Ayurvedic like habits in your life. Or, <laughs> I, I forgot about oh, like oh, no. Ayurvedic <laughs> doctor. <laughs> but that is such a shame because like I know how much wisdom there is in that whole Ayurvedic system. Like that this is showing that there's a lot of people like you who don't like the red tape, who aren't going to you know, share this in the US at least because of all this legality. Yeah. It was like a constant thing of like having to say certain words and not certain other words and getting, you know, things signed. And I know people that are doing it and it's, that's fine for them. But for me, I was like, huh, I could take this path or I could take this path. And also what I noticed was like, I was able to support so many more people in the space of spirituality and still integrate Ayurvedic practices into it without being an Ayurvedic doctor any longer. Right. So it worked out really well for me. Okay. I, I I wasn't planning to get into this, but I think it's such an interesting, like you're a bridge because you went to med school, your family's doctors, and then you studied Ayurveda. And so like at you as a person, you've, you've seen the bridge of like the holistic wellness with like medicine, right? 
Yeah, I've definitely seen both sides. I know that some people like to say like um, holistic medicine, or they say like alternative medicine, right? Like Western medicine is the original and then alternative is the alternative. It, to me, it's not like that. I see everything as complementary, mm. right? I'm a big believer in being able to use Western medicine alongside Ayurveda and Chinese medicine and, you know, using acupuncture and healing your body in natural ways as well. But I think that there is definitely a space for Western medicine in our lives, you know, when it's like comes to scans and tests and emergencies and things like that. Absolutely. And I think that there's a big component of um, traditional medicine, right, that can be healing and be, help us to even prevent disease from forming in our bodies, which is also very, very valuable. Yeah. I think that's that's a general, I guess, theme is like these traditional medicines, like ch Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, are a lot preventative. And then Western medicine is like, at, what's it called? after you have a problem, then you like go get it fixed. Triage. Yeah. Tri yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. I have a few topics that I want to go into with you. Um, the first one being chakras, because I know you like to talk about chakras. We haven't talked about it on the podcast. So can you explain your understanding of chakras to people who, who don't get it? They're like, is it woo woo? Is it real? What is it? Sure. <laughs> the idea, the topic, the knowledge of chakras have been around for, for thousands of years, right? Originally, there is actually 114 different chakras or energy centers in the body. We talk mainly about seven, the seven that are centrally focused. And this is kind of an a, amalgamation, I'll say, of the other ones put together. Um, but the main seven, which I think if you really focus on these seven and focus on bringing that back into balance, you'll be pretty good, right? Um, the main seven really are right down your spine. It starts from the base of your spine and works its way up. Some of the more well-known ones is obviously the throat chakra, the heart chakra. You want me to name them all? I can if you want. <laughs> no? Yeah, you okay. go for it real quick. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this starts with the root chakra. Then on top of that is the um, sacral chakra. On top of that is the solar plexus. Then the heart, the throat, the third eye, and the crown right? And each one is like the center of something different. Uh, so let's just say like um, for self-expression, it's going to be with your throat chakra, right? Um, your heart is the space of compassion and love and things like that. So, and the crown is like your connection to your high, to the higher self and to your connection to God, the universe, more um, energetic topics and things like that. Yeah. So what does it mean when people say a chakra is blocked? Like and how do you identify blockages and unblock them? Yeah. So the idea that a chakra can get blocked or unblocked is a misnomer. <laughs> and I'll say this because like I use the words blocked and unblocked in explaining chakras, right? And I do that because it's colloquially known as such that a chakra can get blocked and unblocked. It's more so, I want people to think of it more so as balanced or unbalanced, mm -hmm. right? So it's about bringing it back into balance, but it's not, it's not a block. It's balance and imbalance. Um, one thing that can actually help you to balance all of your chakras um, indiscriminately, I'll say, is meditation. Having a regular meditation practice can really help to align yourself, and bring peace to yourself and really help you center and bring calm into your life in general. And it's really interesting because a lot of people think like, oh, meditation, that's only going to assist me spiritually. It does help you spiritually. <laughs> And um, physiologically, a meditation has been scientifically proven to help reduce stress levels, mm -hmm. right? And when we are, when we have high stress, we have high cortisol levels. When we have, um, when we're meditating and we lower our stress, we're also lowering our cortisol levels, which then interacts with all of our different hormones in our body, especially for women. It, a, cortisol has a direct correlation to progesterone levels. So if you're having troubles with your periods or like, um, you know, hormonal things or, or lots of uh, PMS and things like that, that could be the direct, you know, correlation of having too much stress in your life. And reducing that stress can be achieved through meditation, through regular meditation practice. Right. So when your chakras are in balance, I, I know these are energies, but is it related to like the physical place? Like, is there, you, you know what I mean? Like, how do you connect the energetic, spiritual, and the physical? Like, is it literally like something's wrong with my stomach if it's, you, you know what I mean? I see what you're saying. Yes. So each chakra does have an area of the body that it correlates with, right? So like a throat chakra, throat chakra is going to be your throat, your mouth area, and it's also going to be correlating with speech and self-expression, right? So things like that, the heart chakra is obviously going to be associated with the heart, the lungs, and things like that. So there's the... um 
uh, let's say the sacral chakra, if you want to talk about that, that's a center of creativity. But guess what? It's also the center of sexuality, of um, sensuality, of your reproductive organs and things like that. So each one has the physical correlation to the organs, as well as a correlation to what it can then be linked to creativity, uh, being outspoken. And then in correlation to that, it can also be associated with the issues that might people might be facing, right? If you're constantly dealing with asthma, sore throats, uh, mouth sores, teeth issues, uh, well, maybe there's something there. Maybe if you're having difficulty expressing yourself, if you're having um, shyness or you stutter, you know, that's all related to the throat chakra. Yeah. I think it's so interesting once you connect that, even like when you experience heartbreak, like it feels like you're a physical pain in your chest. So is that related to the chakra? Like it's, it's both physical and energetic. And emotional. Absolutely. It's everything coming together. Right. And that's, that's kind of the, the whole correlation of everything, I think. And that's a big thing in Ayurveda, right? In Ayurveda, it's the belief that everything works together. It's not just that you're treating the spiritual aspect of a person or the physical aspect of a person. You're treating the person, the person as a whole. Right. And the idea is kind of like you water the root of the tree and then you're able to enjoy the fruit of it. So you have to really take care of the person as a whole. And I do follow that ideology. And um, in my practice, when I'm working with clients, I absolutely look at each client as a whole. And Mm -hmm. they might come to me saying like, I want to know how to manifest more money. I want to manifest love in my life and my dream partner, you know, and that's, those are the two things that people should come to me for. Manifesting love and partnership and manifesting wealth. And Mm -hmm. it's like, cool, let's do it. You know, it, it it goes much, much deeper into the levels of, you know, self-acceptance and understanding and lifestyle modifications. It's never just like, say this spell, you know, I I know a lot of people would hope, (laughs) would so hope that I'm like, Hey, you know, here's a spell, use this salt and you know, sprinkle it on your house and you're done kind of thing. It doesn't really work like that. The power in manifestation, in any manifestation method that you use, and there's like, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of methods is you, right? Because the common denominator in all of these methods is you. So the power doesn't come from the salt or the cinnamon or the, you know, the lemon or the lime or whatever it is that you're using. It comes from you and it's the direction of your thoughts, of your feelings, of your intentions, right? And when you're super focused, that's when things start to shift in your life. There's a big aspect of the woo-woo in it, right? And there's a big aspect of practicality in it. When I talk about manifestation, I often talk about the six steps of manifesting, the six things that you really have to do with manifesting. And one of the last things that I talk about is aligned action. But guess what? That's huge. If you are sitting in your basement trying to manifest something, guess what? (laughs) You're not really putting any aligned action towards it. And you get frustrated because it's not happening. But if you're looking to start a new job, but you never apply for a job, right? Applying for the job would be aligned action. If you're looking to get a new job, but you never clean up your resume or go to a networking event. Okay, well, those things would be aligned action, right? So it's like really taking those steps in your life is so important in in achieving anything and showing the universal forces that you're actually ready for this, right? You're ready to bring in this new job into your life. You're ready to bring in more money into your life. You're ready to have an amazing partner in your life. Yeah. So are you of the belief that you have to be like, have your chakras balanced and you have to be healthy and everything for your manifestations to come true? Like how healthy mentally, emotionally do you have to be? Or, or yeah. So you're saying like, you can still be imbalanced and not that healthy and you can still manifest. (laughs) I'm just wondering how, what's the connection there? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's such a great question. Okay. So you're manifesting all the time. You're manifesting 24 seven all the time, whether you're doing consciously or unconsciously is the different, right? So we manifest all the time from birth. We're constantly creating our reality. We're constantly creating our world and the things that we're encountering and interacting with. The thing is, is if you're doing it consciously or unconsciously. So if you're doing it consciously, you can really direct your thought to what it is that you want. If you're doing it unconsciously, it really like falls into the default state of your limiting beliefs. And then it, hop, it that's what you end up creating. And then mm-hmm. you collect more evidence towards it. You put more energy and focus towards it. And that grows and grows and grows, right? Mm-hmm. So where you're putting your focus is going to grow. Where you're putting the energy is going to grow. You're going to start seeing more and more of that in your life. So that's really the difference there, right? You're always, always manifesting. Um, have I ever seen a person who is ill manifest? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Have I ever seen a person who was very imbalanced manifest? 
Yeah, you can. It's just a matter of you being in the space of having that focused energy. Now, do I recommend that everybody try to uh, balance their chakras and eat healthier and be vibrant and exercise? Absolutely. Because I want the world to be like that, right? I know the levels of joy and everything that comes from that lifestyle. But do you absolutely need to be in the best health, 100% perfect all the time to manifest? No, you're already manifesting. I see. Oh, that's so interesting. Because sometimes you hear things like, oh, your your manifestation is not coming true because you don't, like there's some, you're not at that energetic level, right? Like some something like that. So I do believe that, right? If you are not an energetic match for what it is that you're creating, then it's it's going to be really hard to come to you. It's it's not really going to be, you're not really calling it and magnetizing it into your life. So there's a couple of things that happen when someone is trying to manifest something and it's not happening, right? One of the things is that they're, they have a lot of limiting beliefs. And we kind of touched on that before. If I'm manifesting a big house and the first thing that I think of when I'm thinking about this big house is who's going to clean those toilets? Oh my God. You know, it's like this sense of like, oh, I don't want to do that, you know? So it, that's a limiting belief that pops up. Or mm. how am I going to pay the gardener for my, you know, mm. my 100-acre yard or whatever the case is? Okay, well, that's a limiting belief that comes up for you, right? Or if you're in the space of thinking about manifesting your dream partner and you think of, oh, but he's going to cheat on me. Mm, gosh, that's a limiting belief coming up for you, right? So limiting beliefs is probably the number one thing that blocks manifestations. Something else that, that can absolutely block a manifestation is having a lot of hope, Right? Yeah, hope is actually the killer of manifestations because a hope is like a waffle. I really hope it happens. You know, I really hope. What you truly need is faith. Having faith that your manifestation is coming true and just knowing it, like having that inner knowing that it's happening, that's where the power of, of magnetism comes through, right? That's where the power of law of attraction, you're really activating it yeah. when you have that faith. Yeah. The yeah. other thing is truly having gratitude. If you are not grateful for what it is that you currently have, guess what? <laughs> you're not going to get anything else, right? Think of it as if you're giving someone a gift. If I gave you a gift and you didn't say thank you or you hated it or you were always constantly complaining about what I gave you, uh, am I going to want to give you another gift? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when it's like you're manif- when you're when you're looking to manifest a house, see and be grateful for what it is that you have currently, the home that you have currently. Yeah, it might have a leaky roof, but you know what? Maybe you're focusing on how great your neighbors are, right? Maybe you're focusing on the great sunlight that comes through the windows, right? Be in the space of being really grateful for what it is that you currently have. And sometimes that can be really hard because what we have might not be what we ultimately want. But yeah, being in the space of gratitude is what really helps to bring bring your manifestations to life. Yeah. Let's talk about how to release limiting beliefs. Cause I think that you, it is one of the things that block people. Um, so what advice do you have on that? What are any, any like methods or practices? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things that I work with clients on, and I think is very powerful is doing shadow work. Sometimes it's called inner child work. Um, but really working on where those limiting beliefs came from. So sh- shadow work is basically finding the root cause of a limiting belief, right? Mm-hmm. And it might be you looking into your past. It might be looking into emotions and things like that. And just seeing like, hey, just just being an observation of things in your life, in your past and events that kind of have stuck with you. And I always tell people like, it's not that you're there to defend your past self. It's not that you're there trying to dig, you know, you're not an archaeologist in your life. You're, you're not really doing anything. You're literally being an observation. You're just seeing the events. And sometimes when we just give the space to look and be in observation, be the observer, it gives us a new insight. It gives us a different point of view. It allows us to have some freedom from that limiting belief. I can share some of my limiting beliefs yeah, if you want me to. Go for it. Sure. Yeah. So um, through doing shadow work, I had come upon this um, instance that happened, this event that happened in my childhood. It was actually, I was, as a kid, I really, really wanted to become a singer. Mm-hmm. So I had joined the school choir, right? And I remember one day we were in the auditorium on the bleachers, standing there, we're all singing. And my my music teacher, I'll just call her Mrs. K, she stopped everybody and she was like, let that come down here. And I was like, oh my God, this is my chance. I got my solo. I know it. I was so excited. Walked down there and she looks at me and she goes, you have a terrible voice. You shouldn't mm-hmm. sing. You probably shouldn't speak. Sit down. You're out of the choir. And she made me sit in the auditorium, you know, chairs. And of oh course, God. this whole bleacher full of students were like, 
oh man, they were like laughing and oh, I could have just shriveled up into a little ball in that moment, you know, and it was devastating for me. And in that moment, I had made the choice that she was right and that I couldn't sing. My voice had no value and I shouldn't speak up. And then guess what? For the next decade of my life, guess what I did? (laughs) I didn't speak up for myself. I didn't know that my voice had value and I totally, totally dimmed my own light. And it was only through the space of, of shadow work and really understanding this, right, that I was able to shift it. And I was able to be in that space of forgiveness, not only to Mrs. K, but like also to myself for even accepting that because there could have been someone else that went through a same or similar event and been like, whatever, what does she know? Bye, you know, (laughs) went running off. So it's not about the event in itself. It's about the meaning that we made in that event. Right. And I made the meaning that my voice had no value. Right. Right. And it just, then it, it continued and continued and continued. And what shifted for me when I had really done this deep work was that my voice did have value. And that's when I really had stepped into my coaching practice and things really took off. And now, you know, I I work with a lot of social media and all of these things and I make a a ton of videos and I'm able to really truly express myself and impact the world. And I always think back to that moment, right? And if I had chosen to continue to stay silent and to think that my voice didn't have any value and it didn't matter what I said, man, life would be different not only for me, but for how many millions of people. Exactly. Like your voice is your power. Like this is the important work you're doing. Um, how did you ingrain like the new belief? Like, were there any things that you did to, cause, cause I know it's not like a black and white thing. Once you you're, yes, yeah, you can be aware of when the trauma happened, the, the limiting belief, but how do you actually change and how do you actually believe the new version of, of who you are? for me and how I teach my clients is like, it takes time and it takes practice, right? And continuation, dedication, and really being dedicated to it. But once you're able to identify either an event or the limiting belief, you don't even have to remember the whole event, right? Even if you're able to identify the limiting belief, maybe the limiting belief is I'm not good enough, right? And that's what keeps coming up for you. Flip it. Mm -hmm. Start to continuously tell yourself, I am good enough. I'm amazing. I am wonderful. I'm incredible right? And really hype yourself up. So you're working on the other aspect of it. And this is going to take a while for you to really believe it. Because at first, when you start saying it to yourself, it's going to feel like a lie. Oh my gosh, it's going to feel like a lie. But the more that you work with it, the more it's going to feel true to you. And the more that you work with it, the more you're going to be able to collect evidence of how awesome you are. Because you have spent the past X amount of time collecting the evidence that you're not good enough. I didn't get that job. Didn't get that guy. Look at that. My car even sucks, you know? But guess what? When you start to change your vocabulary and how your inner voice speaks to yourself, you're going to start to be encouraged to collect evidence on all the times that it did work, right? Look at that. that. I did get that guy. Look at this. My house is amazing. Look at this. I have an incredible kid, right? And you start to collect evidence and your mind shifts to a different direction. Yeah. I think that I love that advice, collect evidence, because it's it builds your confidence. Like I, I talk about this in my videos too, this concept of like the more wins you have, the more confident you get. It's just about, you know, putting yourself out there, living life, and then collecting evidence of the belief you want to believe in. For sure. Yeah. Love that. Okay. Um, so on the topic of manifestation, what is like the mo what I guess what are the most powerful practices that have worked for you or that you teach? Sure. I am, I'm a big believer of really reducing limiting beliefs and doing a lot of shadow work. Cause I know that that kind of opens the doors for you to manifest anything you want, but in the space of techniques, um, there's a couple of written techniques that I truly believe in. I think what I've noticed over the past, you know, 10 plus years of being a coach is that when people write down their manifestations, there's power to it. Mm-hmm. The second thing that I noticed was that when there's any kind of limitation or resistance to it, people don't do it. I actually, I actually wrote a book and I have a copy here. So I want to show you guys. So it's called the law of attraction manifestation journal. It's available on Amazon and um, Barnes and Noble. It's available uh, worldwide. It's published by uh, Penguin Random House and Zeitgeist. And in the book, we talk about three different manifestation methods, right? And they're all written methods. And the reason that I chose to publish it as a book as a journal, was that in the back of the book, you actually have space to practice the methods that you learn, mm-hmm. right? So you learn the method. It's not not a long read. You get through it. You learn the method and then you do it, right? So the thing is like having the knowledge is one thing. Having the intention is one thing, right? But being able to put it into practice and implement it into your life 
is life-changing. It's transformative. I know there's tons of people that are like, yeah, I know water manifestation, but I never do it. I know about this written. I know about the five, five method, but I never do it. And I'm like, great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you have to do it for it to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I, mean, if, it, I think it's easier to think of when people think of it like in a physical form, right? So we know you should be eating vegetables, you know, but if you don't do it, guess what? You're not going to have the results. You know that you, you should be working out and, you know, working your heart and things like that and doing cardio. But if you don't do it, you're not going to have the results. So it's just, it's the same thing. When you're putting something into practice in your life, you're so much more likely to actually get the results that you want to see. Right. So what is the practice in your journal or I guess your favorite practice that you want to share? Sure. I'll talk about them. Um, there's three practices. There's a 369 method, the 555 method and scripting. For me, yeah. it depends on what I'm manifesting. Okay. So like if it's, so the 555 method I'll talk about is is like something that you can do over five days, right? Mm. It really works on your subconscious, on shifting your subconscious narrative. And in that five days, you might see your manifestation come true. But more likely what's going to happen is that something shifts within you, right? Mm. And you're more apt to believe that what you want to manifest is coming your way. So that's, I think, is a very powerful method. The, in the 369 method, um, I really like that for things that are like longer, <laughs> you know, like something that is bigger. Cause, cause I will do the three, six, nine method for like 30, 40 days. Right. And every single day, the method is involved in writing your affirmation three times in the morning, six times in the afternoon and nine times at night. It keeps you very much ingrained in that manifestation, in the thought of what it is that you want to create into your life. So I'll use that for like different things. Okay. So I've used the scripting method to actually manifest our house. So mm. we live on a farm in the middle of the woods, oh. um, you know, and in and, and like a little cottage and it, it's amazing. And this is exactly what we had wanted. And me and my husband used the scripting method to find it, to be in exact, um, you know, energetic alignment with this place. We did that through scripting and it was a really beautiful process. I like scripting because it really taps into your five senses, right? So when we were writing about the future home that we would have, we write things like, I'm so happy and grateful that we have this beautiful home in which we can raise our children and they can run around safely outside, right? There's this beautiful babbling brook that runs through our property. We love being able to see deer and um, smell magnolia trees and, you know, like all of those things. Like we were really tapping into our senses when we were creating this. And that's exactly what we found. I love that for you. I, I love scripting. That's one thing that I, one, one, one way I like to manifest. Um, but go back to the 555 method because I haven't heard of that. What, what is it? How do you do it? Yeah. So the 55 method, sometimes it's called the 5 by 55 or the 55 by 5 method. Um, so you are creating a concise affirmation and you're writing it down 55 times a day, right? Mm, okay. And in that, you're writing it again, again, and again, and again. And you, it could take you like an hour to do, right? Wow. But you're yeah. dedicating yourself to it and being consistent with it for five right. days. And a lot of times what happens in this five-day period is that you have the subconscious shift that happens because it's not only you thinking it, the physical form of you actually writing it and putting pen to paper. Oh man, putting a pen to paper is so powerful because it really takes your mental idea and your what's in your ether space and takes it one step closer to reality. Oh, I love that. So you're saying it works because of the repetition and also you physically writing it out, right? Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So let's talk about mindset shifts. Because I'm sure. curious, what has been a big mindset shift that changed your life? Kind of some of the stuff that we were I had mentioned before with doing the deep shadow work and understanding how much value I had and I could share with the world. Um, I think also the concept of being good enough to go after things was a huge shift for me as well. You know, and that can show up in people's lives in the space of like never going for the promotion or not feeling good enough to ask someone out or not feeling good enough to create a YouTube video, you know, whatever it is for you. Um, but yeah, when you truly believe that it, anything is attainable, that you're good enough to achieve it, that, hey, there's this path to it possibly being achieved, it's really powerful. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, me personally too, the I'm not good enough limiting belief is one of the biggest things that I've had to work on. It's one of my biggest crutches. And I'm sure a lot of people listening can relate. So what would be your recommendation on working through that? Is it the same thing, just the shadow work? Like any specific, I don't know, what else do you have that you, you would share about that? Yeah. So doing shadow work is very powerful. Um, actually, the next book that I'm writing is all about shadow work and tapping into your limiting beliefs and really being able to move past them, right? There's different things that you can actually do to also support your 
shadow work healing, your shadow work journey. And um, some of those things might be like doing mirror work. I think mirror work is very, very powerful in the space of really connecting with yourself. Um, using, using modalities like EFT, emotional freedom technique or tapping um, in there can be very powerful. As well. There's a lot of different techniques that you can kind of harness to assist yeah. you and make it easier as you're going through this process of shadow work. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are your favorite techniques that you use? I love mirror work and I love EFT tapping. Um, I also really, really enjoy doing um, deep journaling and scripting, you know, answering those shadow work questions, the shadow work prompts and going really deep into it. I have found to be so transformative for myself. Mm, Love it. Love it. Okay. um, Now shifting gears to your spiritual practice. um, What does that look like? Do you have any routines? Like what are the things that you like absolutely have to do? So I'm a meditator. I've been a transcendental meditator since my early 20s. So now for almost 20 years at this point. And every day meditate for twice a day, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. If I skip a meditation, if I miss a meditation, I can feel it (laughs) energetically. It's a difference for me, right? So that's a big part of my spiritual practice. Um, I'm also a big believer in like spreading kindness and love. I will constantly do random acts of kindness out in the world. Um, and continue to spread love in any different way that I can. It's uh, That's a big part of my spiritual practice. And I know that people might not maybe associate that with it, but it's it's true. The energy that you put out into the world is what there is for you to access in the world. You know, It's not necessarily what you put out, you get back. It's not, not, I don't look at it like that, but I look at it like if I'm putting kindness out into the world, then guess what? There's more kindness in the world. And guess mm-hmm. what? Who else is you know, part of that kindness? My kids get to interact with that kindness. Yeah. I get to interact with that kindness. Yeah. You know, like all the people that I love have a little more kindness in the world to, to be a part of. And um, that's, that's a huge thing for me. Yeah, that's definitely a spiritual practice. I love that so much. Um, So in terms of meditation, explain to our listeners, what is transcendental meditation? And I'm curious, have you tried other types of meditation? Like, do you alternate between different types or do you just, you know, why do you stick with that? I personally practice transcendental meditation. And that doesn't mean that you or any of the listeners need to practice transcendental meditation. I'm not an affiliate for them or anything like that. But I'll tell you the things that I really like about transcendental meditation, right? Um, so one of the things is that there's a huge structure behind it. They have a, a huge backing. There's a lot of um, people, <laughs> you know, so whenever I feel like I need a check-in or I need someone to kind of talk to or want to do like a meditation related event or something like that, or an event with meditators, there's a huge TM community, right? And I can always have someone to tap into. Recently, actually, oh, this past summer, my father passed away. And it was like such a difficult, you know, earth shaking kind of thing for me. And it was weird because I was like, man, I teach people this stuff all the time, like how to deep with, you know, how to deal with deep grief and how to deal with the sadness and stuff like that. And I was failing hard. I was not doing the things, you know, I was finding myself in this deep, dark hole. And it was, it was showing up for me in the space of like, I was struggling to meditate. And one of the things that kind of popped up in my head was like, hey, you know, you're part of TM, you're part of this big organization, reach out to them. And I did, I sent an email and the next day someone reached out to me and said, hey, there's a person that can help you get a check-in, you know, like a meditation check-in that you can talk to 30 minutes away. You can set up a time with them and go see them. And I was like, what? Like I live in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, they're just 30 minutes away. Like that's insane. Um, when I used to live in Florida, you know, there was tons of different centers and people that I could talk to and kind of like, there's, there's that whole structure and it, it's a lot of support. So especially for like new meditators, if you're struggling with meditation, if you feel like you need a community of meditation, um, there's that. Right. And then also I went to, uh, Maharishi International University and uh, to, to go to that university, to get any kind of degree from them, you have to be a TM meditator. So that kind of like, you know, played into it. But for a very long time, I practiced um, Vipassana meditation and I really enjoyed Vipassana meditation too. And for the listeners, if you don't know what Vipassana meditation is, it's a longer form meditation, right? So you would be meditating for an hour, two hours, three hours, 10 hours kind of thing. It's beautiful. And there's so much that comes out of these, this long form meditation. What I realized for me was that it wasn't sustainable in my lifestyle. And I ended up getting very frustrated about it, right? Because I so wanted to be able to sit down and meditate for 90 minutes a day. And guess what? (laughs) My two-year-old didn't want me to. (laughs) It would be climbing on my face or my dog needed something or, you know, it was like, it wasn't achievable for me. And I still will go to um, 
Vipassana meditation retreats and things like that and and partake in that in that time frame. But on a regular daily basis, I, I don't practice Vipassana meditation. I practice transcendental meditation because that works for me. And I want to encourage people to like do the type of meditation that's going to work for you. Don't worry about like what other people think. It doesn't matter what's going to work for you. It's going to be what's going to work for you. And everyone's meditation experience is going to be completely different. You know, right. just because, you know, when I meditate, I see nothing or you see, you know, blue light or stars or whatever the case mm-hmm. is. It's different for everybody. And it's different for each time that you actually meditate. One of the big things also to remember is that we're not meditating to get good at meditation. There's like, you know, I've been meditating for like my whole life basically, right? And it's not like I'm striving to become good at meditation. The thing is, meditation is helping me to become better at life, right? To become a more receptive, centered person, responsible person in my life, rather than being a reactionary person in life and showing up in that manner. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about your, I guess, goal or motivation to meditate because I know a lot of people have trouble being consistent with meditation. Like I'm, everyone by now has heard meditation is good for you. You should do it every day. But who's actually doing it every day? Like, what? Where does? Where do you find that motivation? Like, how do you build that consistency? I think that that they go hand in hand, really. So the thing is, I I am also neurodivergent. So if I don't have things put in place for them to happen, I will forget about it. It will never happen. So with meditation, one of the things is I have a specific spot that I meditate and it's, it's in every home that we have. Like there's my mommy's meditation spot. My kids know it. Everybody knows this is mommy's meditation spot. And it's not like no one else can be there or use it or whatever. That's not it. But I know too, this is my space. So it never gets piled with books. It never gets overwhelming. It's always a space that I'm like, this is it, you know, mm-hmm. it's open and everybody knows, don't put your, don't put your jacket on this spot. This is where mommy sits to meditate, right? Because how many times, I mean, I, I encountered it so many times when I would be like, okay, I'm going to go meditate. Oh my God, but there's this pile of laundry here, you know, or, oh my God, there's a stain on this chair. Like I would just easily get pulled away from, from the practice. So now I really put the things in place to, to really help me to be in success, to be successful in what I want to accomplish, which is meditation practice. The other thing is to really set a schedule. I have an alarm that goes off in my phone and it reminds me and it says, hey, five minutes to meditate, you know, Mm -hmm. five minutes until your meditation time kind of thing. And it goes off twice a day. And the thing is, if I reset it and I say like, oh, do it later, that's okay. I don't hold myself to, I have to meditate every day at eight o'clock or five o'clock or whatever the case is. Yeah, that'd be great. And that's ideal. But if it doesn't happen, I don't beat myself up about it. I'll say, you know what? Five o'clock didn't work for me today, but I have a spot at 6.30 and I'm going to do it then. And I will just boop. I like that you reschedule. It's not like, oh, I failed at, yes. I, I failed at meditation today. It's, oh, I can, I can do it a little later. Yeah. It's, I get to do it later, right? It's not, and I, and I always think of it like that. It's not that I, it's not that I, oh my God, I have to meditate today. It's I get to meditate today. I get to put this energy out there into the world. I get to have this moment to myself, this place to be centered, this this like peace within me. Right. Love it. Okay. So with your background studying Ayurveda, nutrition, and medicine, I'm sure you have like so much knowledge in wellness, <laughs> all this stuff. So um, what are your top wellness practices or tips, or what do you think is like most important for people to be aware of? Okay. So we talked about meditation. I think that's huge in the space of life. Um, secondarily, I think that it, being connected to nature is super important, right? Whatever that looks like for you, whether that looks like you taking walks in parks or grounding yourself or going to the beach or whatever it is, be surrounding yourself by nature. Um, I'm a big advocate of uh, qual- eating quality foods, uh, whatever type of diet you practice, right? I'm not going to get on people if they're not vegetarian or if they're meat eaters or whatever the case is it's fine. Like you choose your practice for your life. I know what works for my life, but I would just say like, encourage you to have high quality products when you are consuming anything. Mm. Um, I also am a big believer in herbal medicines and really working with nature in that aspect, not only surrounding yourself by nature, but allowing you to be a part of nature, consuming Mm -hmm. nature. Yeah. And um, I think those are the big ones. Yeah. Okay. So meditation, spending time in nature, and also consuming high quality foods like and, that are f- from nature, <laughs> not yeah, too processed. Yeah. It's really interesting because I never really considered food to be spiritual at all. Honestly, um, it is. It so is. Actually, I. It was really only after I met my husband and I married him. He is a professional chef, right? So Ooh, he is like I very eat. much into. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm so lucky. Right? He's oh always God. making something gourmet. It's, oh it's, my it's God. really, really mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
it's it's incredible. It's like one of my biggest manifestations, one of my hugest blessings was really finding my husband. And, and, and you're laughing. It's true. It's true. I totally yeah. manifested him. Um, I was previously married in my early 20s and it blew up in my face. <laughs> Ended in divorce. I was so upset. It just like my life was crumbling, right? And um, for a long time, I was single after that. And I, I had this idea like, oh, everybody's out to hurt me. I could never be with anybody. All of these stories that, you know, create like, oh, all people cheat, like, uh, you know, all these things. And it wasn't until I worked through those limiting beliefs and truly focused on what it is that I did want in my life. And that's when I was able to call him into my life. I literally met him in an art gallery and, um, you know, it was from that day. I don't know. I, I made a TikTok video about it and it went like super viral, but um, no, that sounds so romantic. Like this story, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you more of the story. So yeah. I was manifesting him. I had certain qualities that I was like, oh man, this is exactly what I want in a person. And I still remember it to this day. Yeah, how detailed did now. you get? Were you like, he needs to be a chef? <laughs> he needs, or... No, no. So I did put on my list though. I said, um, must know how to cook and love and enjoy cooking, right? Because at the time I was single and one, that was like such a burden to me to be able to cook for one person. I don't know. Energetically, I was like, oh my God, this is like terrible. If I made a big meal, then I would have to eat it for like the whole week. And I was like, I just want to eat something else, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I was like, I just want someone to share meals with and to be able to split the responsibility of, you know, with. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I had put on my list, you know, must know how to cook, must love children. Uh, my, uh, my ideal partner is, uh, tall over six feet. I really like tall guys. Um, funny, open-minded can talk to me about philosophy and, you know, all the topics that I like to talk about must love art. I'm a, I'm an artist and I love to, you know, put beauty and art and aesthetic around me. It's, it's really meaningful to me. So I was like, I want someone that's in alignment with all these things. There's probably a couple of other things on this list too. Um, and I remember I got out of my car at the Norton Art Gallery in West Palm Beach. And I saw him from across the parking lot and it was almost like a little ding went off in my head. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> what? Oh my God. You know, and yeah. I saw him and he's, he's tall and he's cute. And I was like, oh, he's cute. Okay. Um, and we kind of like merged. It was, we walking into the, um, the, the gallery, he opened the door for me and I was like, oh, that was really nice. Oh. I walked into the front desk and, um, they had a sign there and it said, you know, students, it's, it's only $5 if you're a student. And I was like, oh, that's great. Cause I thought it was 10 bucks, you know? So I, I gave the lady my uh, $10 and I said, Hey, um, I'm a student. And she said, Hey, what about, what about your friend behind you? Is he a student? And I was like, yeah, he's a student. I was like, you know what? And, and I'll buy his ticket. I had the 10 bucks anyways. <laughs> so I bought him a ticket and she was like, oh, that's really nice of you to buy him a ticket. And I said, you know what? It's cool. He's going to buy me dinner later. And she kind of laughed. You said that, <laughs> right? Like in the beginning, before you had a conversation with him. Before I said anything to me, you know, I probably said, thank you for holding the door to him. Aww. And uh, we walked away from the desk and I gave him the ticket. And I was like, I was just kidding. You know, I was like, just trying to do, you know, random act of kindness. It's cool. You know, man, I was just joking. And he was kind of laughing and we were chatting and he goes, you know, I don't know about buying you dinner sometime, but I would love to make you dinner sometime. I'm a professional <gasps> chef. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he, wow. You know, and, and we spent the day together and it was like, you know, we had spent the day together just walking around the gallery for hours. It was a Wednesday, you know, what is the likelihood of two people, two single people meeting in that moment at an art gallery in this space when we're both also from New York and we met in Florida? You know, and it was like in this moment, in this precision that had to happen, all the things that had to happen in alignment for us to actually. The universe sent him incredible. to you. Like it's definitely like it's aligned. My manifestation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. So beautiful. Um, next, I want to ask you, what is like a topic that you're like most excited about? What are you studying? What are you learning right now? So farming, <laughs> actually. I know that's like way on the other side of maybe things that we're talking about. Let's talk about that. Why do you choose to live on a farm and learn about that? Because I can control what goes into my food. And then that includes like pesticides and hormones and all that stuff, but also like the energetics of it, right? Like we are, we use like beautiful fertilizers, natural things in our products. And, um, you know, we have chickens and our chickens are so loved. My kids cuddle our chickens every single day, you know, and they're, they're well fed and, and they're well taken care of. And, um, you know, we're able to grow our own vegetables and there's something special about being able to like eat something right off the vine, like to pluck a tomato off the vine. You made and that. Smell it. You grew that. Yes. Yeah, you beautiful. nurtured that into growth. It's just like, there's such a, there's such like a, a piece of fulfillment for me in that, that I was like, wow, this is amazing. How many different uh, vegetables or things do you grow at your home? 
not many. Um, okay. This is our first year being full time farmer, so I will okay. say that that is my okay. my kind of like thing out and there. What's but, on uh, the we, roster? What what is there? So this year we grew um, blueberries, strawberries, uh, raspberries, wine berries. We had a lot of berries growing. We also have apple trees, pear trees. Um, we have squash, zucchini, cucumbers, tomatoes. Uh, potatoes, garlic, onions, you know, that whole kind of gamut of things. You can make so many meals with all of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's been really cool to have, you know, all these things grow. And we've, we've had successes and failures. Our, our carrot crop didn't do so well this year. Our potatoes gave us, you know, like two potatoes. One of our, we, we had like potato bags, you know, and we're so excited to dig up our potatoes and it's like, boop, like this little, little, Like I, I have like blueberries and avocado tree and I didn't realize like they grow so, sl- it's, it's so little. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, that's just one avocado. Okay. <laughs> it kind of also represents me to being so grateful for all of the energy that, that needs to be put in for a, a large potato <laughs> to be made, you know, all the variables that have to be in alignment for that avocado to grow so beautifully, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. It's it's beautiful thing to be connected to the earth. Yeah. So so what is your lifestyle now? You mentioned you're going into full time farming and you're co- coaching and you have kids. So like, how do you balance everything? What does your week look like? My week, my month, anything like that. It starts out with me scheduling things, and that has been a huge help for me. If I don't have a schedule, if I'm not maintaining a schedule, it's chaos, right? Because there's there's a big there's a lot of like big things, and you know, coaching in my life is one aspect of it. My family is one as- aspect of it. Farming is one aspect of it. Um, we also own a bunch of properties, so property management, and you know, like I and I'm also an artist, and I sell my paintings, and that's another oh, aspect. Yeah, you I'm do an so many things. Books, yeah. There's so much that goes How on on a daily you basis. Balance? <laughs> scheduling. It's the secret. Okay. It's the secret okay. sauce is scheduling. But guess what? The first thing that I ever schedule in my week, me time. That's the first Ooh, thing I schedule okay. me time. All nice. my meditations are in already, right? That's yeah. already in. That's like on a reoccurring yeah. forever kind of basis. But then yeah. from there, I put in whatever it else, else that is my me time for that week, whatever it is that I need. And that might look like I need to go on a three hour hike or guess what? I need an extra hour this day to, for a nap and I will boop, boop, boop. That goes in first. Because I've learned that if I don't fill my own cup, nothing else is happening. (laughs) I might go through the motions of it happening, but then guess what? I'm more likely to snap at my kids or I'm more likely to fumble on this project or I'm more likely to feel unfulfilled at the end of the day. But when my cup is filled, everything goes a lot smoother. So Mm. I make sure that my stuff is in first. Secondarily, then it's my family's stuff first, you know, second after that. So then it's like, oh, my kids have a recital or I have to do this or I want to take them to school or um, I want to take them to their uh, co-op class because we actually homeschool them, their co-op school kind of thing. Um, Whatever it is, you know, goes in there. And then after that, whatever's left is for the space of, my clients and, you know, all of the other things that I do and the podcast that I'm on and, and time to write books and things like that. It all fills in the rest of that. But I know that the major things are already there. Right. And that helps a lot. Love that. Love it. Me time first and then family, like you have your priorities set. What about like projects? Cause like you mentioned painting or writing a book. Do you try to, do do you kind of like batch things by like, Oh, these months I'm working on this project that like, how do you work on bigger things? No, I do them as I feel them, right? Because there will be, I I will go months without even touching a paintbrush. And then maybe, maybe for like two weeks, I will want to paint nonstop, you know? And it's like, wherever my energy is, I will allow it to go. It's not that I have to put up restrictions or restraints about it. I will just allow that flow to happen. And I mean... The other thing is like painting isn't my full-time job. I am a painter and I do sell paintings and things like that. But guess what? Some years, if I sell five paintings, I'm okay with that. (laughs) It doesn't really matter because it's not, it's not the main thing that is like, you know, earning me an income or anything like that. I don't need to produce. And I, I, that takes the pressure off of things, right? That allows me to create the way that I want to create without it being a force. Like not everything has to become income producing. Not everything has to be in the space of, oh, I need to do this or my family's not going to be able to eat kind Mm. of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that having that separation between all of these things gives me a lot of freedom to Mm. be like, you create what you want. You go with the flow, you chill, you know? Yeah. I like that. I think because you, you mentioned how scheduling is so huge for you as a creative, I'm like, oh, but you can't like schedule creativity. Right. So do you ever feel like limited or how do you deal with creative blocks where you're like, I know I have to come out with these videos or something. And then you, 
Y- y- like, how do you manage your creativity? Because it would be great if we have inspiration all the time, but that's not the case. So I schedule my creativity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And let me how? tell you why. Because me- I know that, especially being a content creator and creating things for Instagram and TikTok and, and YouTube and things like that, I know that I have to produce certain things at certain times, right? So yes, inspiration does not al- is not always there. It does not always appear. But in those moments of inspiration, when I have ideas, I will write out a script. I will jot those ideas down. I have a running um, notepad that's always like, you know, taking notes and always like keeping it really together with my ideas. And then in those moments that I have scheduled for creation, and I also batch create, right? I might end up creating six videos in, you know, the span of two hours or whatever the case is, just switching out my shirts or switching out the locations on our farm, whatever the case is, because I know that those videos are then going to keep me going for the next week that I can, you know, post a video a day or every other day or whatever the case is. But I do schedule my creativity in that aspect. So, but that I, I associate that more with like work. Right. So my, my creation and my creativity for videos is more associated for me with work. And then my creation, my creativity with artwork, creating, um, painting, sculpting, anything like that is more of play. So that's like Mm -hmm. in a separate area for me. And I allow that to be free flow, but in the space of creation for videos and things like that, or editing a video, right. That's a lot less creative. (laughs) Right. So I can schedule schedule that that in. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that there's time for that. I mean, do you ever feel like, like, you know, after you write out your script when you're inspired and then you come back to your script, do you ever feel like a little less inspired to talk? You're like, oh, I wrote that. I don't have the same energy I did when I wrote it. I I feel like I I do that. And I, I, I learned I can't leave too much time between the inspiration and the creation because it goes away. (laughs) Right. Do you experience that? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Sometimes I'll even film like a preliminary video, you know, if it's like a TikTok video inspiration, I will say what I think and make like a very quick video and then save it in my drafts. Right. So then later when I'm ready to actually film it, I'll say like, Oh yeah, these things made sense, but wait, I flubbed up on this word or this didn't make sense, or this wasn't the proper correlation. And I can change it to then like, you know, be more refined with it. And I know that's not how everybody makes videos, but for me in my life, that works really well for me. Just knowing that like, I know at the end of the week, I'm going to have these things set and I don't have to stress about it. Because when it was the other side of it and I was just like, I'll create when I can create, I wasn't, <laughs> you know, and I, I was feeling stressed out when yeah. I was like, oh my God, I have to create a video and I don't know and I don't have a topic and da, da, da. you know, and it gets into this like spiral of I like, oh my gosh, this is phase. Yeah. I'm always in and out of the phase of knowing what I'm doing and not knowing what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like a wave. It's like the ocean coming to shore kind of thing. And, um, it's like, I want to ride the wave. (laughs) I want to be able to harness that energy when the energy is coming through. I really want to be able to harness it. Yeah. All right. Letha. So if you have one piece of advice that you want to leave our listeners with today, what would that be? It would be to do your best to spread more kindness in the world when you have the choice to be kind or not. <laughs> I hope that you choose kindness. Um, I would love for everybody to become meditators. And if you can't meditate every day, maybe try it for twice twice a week. You know, Do what is accessible to you. But I, I just am a big advocate of meditation. I know how much it's impacted my life and the life of my clients and how um, transform, transformative it truly really can be. Love it. Thank you so much. And lastly, where can we find you online? Yeah, you can find me on TikTok. My username is um, Latha underscore J-A-Y. So that's L-A-T-H-A underscore J-A-Y. I'm on Instagram as well. You can find me there. Um, And under both, you make sure that you're following the account that has the blue check mark. I am verified in both, which is incredible. Um, There's a lot of like scammy fake accounts too. So make sure you're following the right one. And you can also find more information about me at my website, which is www.lathaj.com. Amazing, everyone. Definitely check her out. We'll have all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Letha. I had so much fun today. Thank you for sharing Thank your you. energy. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. This was wonderful. I love talking with you. Thank you. 